Welcome back to Good Law, Bad Law. My guest on today's episode is Andy Popper. He is a distinguished professor of law at the distinguished American University, Washington College of Law in Washington, D.C. And he's an expert on something called the Fairies Doctrine. I don't know if anyone listening has heard about it, but it also can be understood as the Supreme Court decision in 1950 that set out an almost complete limitation on the right to bring claims against the government by members of the armed services and their families. It was created at a time that we were welcoming home uh, those who had liberated the world from Hitler and had gone to war to defend the freedoms of this country. And when they came home, we welcomed them with a law and a Supreme Court case that said, we are taking away your rights. And this continues to plague and cause such suffering for so many people who are victims of sexual assault or are victims of uh, medical malpractice or are victims of exposure to toxins at an American base, uh, such as Camp Lejeune. So many people who cannot bring their claims the way ordinary citizens can just because they are members of the armed services. We're gonna have a conversation about this to understand how this came about what it means and what can be done about it. And it also turns out, by the way, that Andy is a successful fiction writer and uh, has we have a fascinating conversation about that as well. So a great episode of Good Law, Bad Law. I hope you enjoy it. Stay tuned. In this country, in the system of laws that we have, citizens have the right to take disputes to court when they've suffered an injury, say, for example, in a medical malpractice case or if they are a victim of sexual assault. But the rules that apply to most citizens do not apply, which is very strange to say, as we'll hear. These rules do not apply in the same way to members of our armed services and their family. Uh, to help us understand how that possibly could be and why that is and what we ought to do about it, I want to welcome my guest, Andy Popper, Andrew Popper, who is a distinguished professor of law and government at American University, Washington College of Law, and an expert on what we'll come to know as the Fairies Doctrine. Andy, thank you so much for being on Good Law, Bad Law today. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, and Andy, I also understand that you have a, uh, a side hustle as a fiction writer, and I want to leave some time at the end of our conversation to talk some about that, because I, uh, I know that's been very important to you. But you've done an awful lot of work and research and writing on the issue of the government's immunity by law by statute and by the opinions of our Supreme Court when members of the armed services uh, have a claim against the government for injuries they've suffered. Uh, what an incredible tension in our law that gives rise to this kind of immunity. I thought perhaps you could uh, start us off by giving us a bit of background on yourself, which I know is quite relevant to your interest in this topic and how your background brought you to this subject as, a, as one of particular interest and concern to you during your professional career. Sure. Uh, what, what law professor doesn't like to talk about themselves? <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, I enlisted in the Marine Corps in 1967 and um, fairly quickly transitioned into intelligence and served in that capacity uh, during the Vietnam War. So I'm a veteran, uh, and uh, when I concluded my service, um, went to law school, and uh, after practicing, uh, was lucky enough to get a job in legal education and have been doing that for the last four decades. So the two pieces of my background that uh, come together with uh, this discussion, one is uh, my concern for and commitment to our 
our members of the armed forces, our veterans, their families, uh, and that's a, both a personal concern and I think also a concern of of government, uh, of, of, of how we treat one another in this country. Um, as you said, the idea that one is willing to fight and die uh, for a system of justice and then is denied access to that system uh, it, it is an anomaly, um, and it's, in my view, inexcusable. But there is a background, and there are reasons why it exists, and now there uh, is the beginning of some set of solutions. Um, so I come at this both as someone who has uh, a concern about and some knowledge of how our armed forces work, and as a law professor, I've been teaching torts, uh, and administrative law, which are both relevant to, to this topic for as long as I've been teaching. Um, and, and that's kind of how I, how I arrived on the scene. Um, I can, if, if it, if it makes sense now, I can give you a little bit of background on how we got to where we are with the Ferris Doctrine, or we can launch right into it with however you want to proceed. Well, I want to, of course, the issue that is very special and unique to uh, members of the armed forces and their families because of the issues it raises being members of the armed forces, uh, you know, bears very uh, specific discussion. But I'd actually like to start by taking a step back before we get to that. Um, sure. which and, and, and address the even broader question of sovereign immunity. Yeah. Uh, and, and I want to perhaps do that by telling a little story that came up recently in one of my cases. I have a case, it's a <clears throat> medical malpractice case, and uh, the government, the United States, has entered on behalf of one of the doctors in the case because this particular doctor uh, worked at a federally funded health clinic here in Philadelphia and uh, as a federal employee, the United States steps in and, and uh, assumes the place of, of the doctor in the case. And I was on the phone with the uh, lawyer for the Justice Department who's representing the United States in this case. And he was, we were discussing some issue in the case relating to uh, keeping certain documents confidential and uh, whether we were going to have a written agreement about that or not, kind of mundane issue in any civil litigation, really. But he started uh, talking about the sovereign. And uh, didn't I appreciate that uh, the sovereign this and the sovereign that? <laughs> and uh, I, uh, there are reasons why I found this person uh, kind of irritating generally. <laughs> Uh, I hope he's not listening to this program. Uh, and uh, me being me, um, to the to the great entertainment of everybody in the office here, I started launching into a screed about the sovereign. And there is no sovereign in this country. And we fought a, a, a war of independence to get rid of the sovereign. And it's not my sovereign. And you know, it was, I mean, it was a bit tongue in cheek, the whole argument that I was making, but with, with also a serious point. And there's a serious question in this silly story that I'm telling, which is, how is it that we got rid of a king in 1776 when we declared independence from England, and yet we still have, a t we took from England this idea of sovereign immunity, that the, the king is above the law and can't be brought into court by a citizen. I mean, I thought that was a big part of not only what we rejected, but uh, found a place in, in some of the more fundamental parts of our Constitution. So I don't know what how, we ha I think we have to start with that idea, because I think to a lot of people, if you start to think about it, as I have, it does seem awfully strange. I agree. Um, it, it is interesting, and it does go back at least uh, to 1776. The impeachment itself has has brought to the fore endless discussions of what the framers intended 
uh, and the, the, the hazards of monarchy and um, what we got out of the process of forming this new and, and, and delicate and critical republic. Um, but the fact of the matter is that in the formation of this government, we were dealing often with lawyers uh, who knew a lot about the English legal system, and they kind of picked from it things that seemed to work and rejected things that were inconsistent with our notions of democracy. And one of the things they picked uh, was the concept of impeachment. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. Which has a long history in enough, law, yeah. Yeah, curiously enough, along with that, they also decided to hang on to the principle that the king can do no wrong, even though we didn't have a king. That didn't seem to be a, a central part uh, of, of the formation of, of our government and our system of law. So um, between 1789 uh, and, and really the, the, the formation of what we think of as our Constitution and um, the present, we've lived with that issue of the extent to which uh, the federal government as a sovereign cannot be sued particularly for personal injury claims. Um, It wasn't until 1946, uh, and a year after uh, World War II ended, and and some years after endless discussion on the topic, that Congress decided to pass the Federal Tort Claims Act, um, which is critical to the discussion that we're having, because that act basically says you know, there's some instances where I suppose we should be accountable. Uh, And when we are in those instances, we stand as a defendant, as any other defendant would if we've done something that is uh, unacceptable, uh, negligent, and and caused harm. Uh, The act itself, however, came with a gigantic exception called the discretionary function exception, and also with some clarity about to whom it would apply. Um, And uh, one group for which there was not clarity uh, was for uh, members of the armed forces. Uh, So between 1946 and 1950, you have a series of uh, district court, circuit court, and Supreme Court opinions trying to sort out where does sovereign immunity apply? Where does the FTCA apply? And how does that work with members of the armed forces? And the decisions are not consistent one with the next. 1950, the United States Supreme Court gets the fourth case it's had by a member of the armed forces that's made it all the way to the Supreme Court, raising this question of can members who are harmed by egregious misconduct outside of combat, outside of armed conflict, outside of sanctioned training, they're harmed by acts that are not sanctioned, not approved, but take place within the context of their military service. Can they bring a lawsuit? And the Supreme Court decides in an act of judicial activism that is almost unparalleled um, at at any point, they basically rewrite the Federal Tort Claims Act as it pertains to members of the armed forces and create a a hole uh, in the Federal Tort Claims Act, declaring that members of the armed forces cannot uh, bring a lawsuit if their injury is incident to their military service, without defining what incident to military service is. Mm -hmm. That case, United States versus Ferris, is the beginning of the end uh, of the rights of service members to access our system of justice. So we've gone roughly for 70 years with a few cases that kind of fit within other exceptions that can be brought and thousands and thousands of other claims that are simply shut down because the person making that claim, the victim, is a member of our armed forces. So that, that's how we got to where, where we are right now. Um, one other point about the, the anecdote that you brought up on sovereign immunity, um, that, of course, resonates with me as a torts professor, not just because of kind of this arrogant assertion of sovereign immunity, but because there is a Volunteer uh, Protection Act from 1999 that makes it very difficult to sue doctors who have committed malpractice, who are uh, working for the federal government if they're volunteering. 
Uh, there's the Federal Tort Claims Act discretionary function exception that you have to get around. There, there, there are many, many obstacles in the way, so I uh, admire you for being willing to take it on. Um, but getting back to Ferris, uh, the, the, the simple truth is that uh, um, those who are willing to fight and die for our system of justice still today do not have access to Article Three courts. All right, but so, there have been changes. All right, so so let's break down what we've covered so far, because uh, yeah. So so we so the Federal Tort Claims Act of 1946 passes uh, as a federal law that opens the door to certain claims against the federal government, but also limits even those claims that are allowed in ways that are not limited in claims brought by citizens where the federal government is not a defendant. And you talk about this in some of your writing. For example, even where you can bring a claim against the federal government, you cannot claim for punitive damages. You are not no punitive entitled... damages, right? no, no jury trial, right. limitations on, on, on damages, plus the, the, the gigantic discretionary function exception, the idea that when you exercise judgment of someone's harm as a consequence of that, the federal government does not waive immunity is central to, to this exception. So, and, and uh, the, the limitation on the right to jury trial I find particularly offensive because mm-hmm. we've, we've enshrined the right to a jury trial in our Bill of Rights. And I think as a trial lawyer, but also as a citizen, I believe that's one of the more fundamental rights that we have in this country. It's one of the defining rights that we have in this country is a right to a trial by jury, except as, a, as, as, as uh, enacted in this law from Congress when the federal government itself is a defendant. Um, <clears throat> so you, you mentioned the uh, discretionary function exception. So wh- wh- yes. how does that play in, and, and what, what limitations or exceptions did that create? In the, uh, in the limited or conditional waiver of immunity in the Federal Tort Claims Act, there was concern that uh, when uh, people who work within the federal government have to make tough decisions, um, exercise their judgment, that if there could be liability, as there would be in any other sector when those decisions turn out not just to be a bad decision but an abuse of discretion, that people within government would be hesitant to make any decisions, uh, that that it, it imposed too great uh, a, a, an obligation, a cost, uh, and, and that people involved in law enforcement or in environmental work or in any field would be constantly second-guessing, how should I do this? Could we get sued? And so Congress decided to just close the door on that. If, if the action of the individuals who are uh, responsible for the harm the victim sustained can be characterized as discretionary, then the waiver of sovereign immunity in the FTCA simply doesn't apply. And that is a big exception. And, and interestingly enough, um, it is it is almost exactly the same set of reasons that led to uh, the Ferris Doctrine, that the Supreme Court was concerned that um, difficult decisions have to be made uh, in uh, the military. Uh, orders that are potentially dangerous and potentially fatal need to be followed. The chain of command needs to be followed. Um, that if one is questioning the uh, every single time one makes a decision who is in a command role, am I going to be sued or not? They're not going to, to take actions that are necessary to protect this country. And so, you, I mean, that, that jumps out of the Ferris case, and it's, it's the same kind of reasoning, and I think it's what has made this difficult. There are, in fact, two sides to this story. Uh, one is that, that, as we've been saying, victims of, of misconduct have every right uh, to access to our courts and to a jury system. And then the flip side is there's something special about the military that does require uh, a higher level of discipline, uh, a sense of uh, the importance of following orders, even if those orders uh, seem to the person receiving them as, as wrong. Uh, and so it's a tough balance. 
Well, and people and once obviously. The Supreme Court set it out. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. No, I mean, once the court set it out, what happened then uh, is that you have many, many, many cases, mostly from circuit courts and a few from the Supreme Court, uh, which I think can be easily characterized as judicial hand wringing of the court saying, gee, this is, this is a really rough doctrine, but, you know, until Congress changes this or until the Supreme Court decides to undo the damage it's done, we just can't do anything. Well, it reminds and me... And so you, you have that long history up there. Yeah, that hang ringing from the judges points to the difficulty of defining this competing interest, the, the military, the very understandable interest we have in a military... Uh, adhering to rules of discipline, of, of chain of command, and things like that. We wouldn't have a military if soldiers could second-guess their orders, um, you know, willy-nilly. I mean, we would, you know, our military power, strength, discipline, effectiveness would, would completely break down, and you can see that. So even where somebody suffers an injury, and you could certainly see that many people on the battlefield, you lived through this in Vietnam, that many people— suffered injuries because of being uh, actively engaged in warfare. And you can understand how we wouldn't really have a system, uh, you know, to, to count on if if the military, that is the government, uh, could be sued by a soldier injured on the battlefield, to pick a very easy and obvious example that highlights those tensions. Uh, but there are a lot of cases that have nothing to do with the battlefield, but exactly. do have to do with uh, uh, active duty service men and women and their families who do suffer an injury because of misconduct. Why should those be precluded? Why should the government have immunity in those cases? And that, I think, as you've you've explained, is where we have judges that hear those cases wringing their hands because it seems so unfair. It is unfair, and it's ridiculous. And the reason it's ridiculous is that we are quite capable of writing legislation uh, that that isolates those areas where the government waives immunity and is willing to be sued and can be accountable, and those areas where it is not willing to waive immunity and can't be sued. And it's very easy to do that. Injuries sustained in the course of combat, you don't have a claim. Injuries sustained in the course of armed conflict, you don't have a claim. Injuries sustained in training, even difficult training, even painful and injurious training that is sanctioned by the military, you don't have a claim. What I have advocated uh, is that egregious malpractice is nowhere sanctioned. Rape and sexual assault is nowhere sanctioned. Uh, unknowing and unconsenting exposure to toxins is nowhere sanctioned. None of those things are, have anything to do with discipline. They have nothing to do with chain of command. Those are acts of misconduct that when they are, and the, 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 that the perpetrators identified, they go to the break. Uh, so obviously they're not sanctioned. And what this has been about for the last couple of years is simple. If those things have nothing to do with essential acts in the course of conducting our national defense, then what possible reason is there to limit the rights of victims uh, of malpractice or sexual assault or rape or unknowing or uh, consenting exposure to, to toxins? In fact, the opposite is true. If you make the government accountable for actions that they already prohibit, then the probability that those actions will continue at the level they have been taking place goes way down. You deter misconduct by creating accountability for misconduct. You create no consequence for misconduct, no consequence to the government itself, not to the perpetrator, no consequence to the government for medical malpractice, no consequence to the government for sexual assault and rape or exposure to a toxin, then where's the deterrent? Why the government doesn't have pay a price for those actions? The moment you impose any liability on the government for that type of misconduct, which involves activity not sanctioned in any way, then the whole training process changes. And since our armed forces 
is predicated on discipline, as soon as there's some liability for the federal government, you can be sure that the message will go out loud and clear if you engage in this kind of misconduct for which we in charge, we in command have responsibility, you will you will see a hell you cannot even imagine. And the incidence of sexual assault and the incidence of rape and the incidence of malpractice will go down. And that's the whole point of, of this current push. Establish well, accountability and and watch what happens. Well, and that's how um, our civil justice works. That's how our civil justice system works in every other context. Uh, it's not Absolutely. only about that's accountability. Our criminal justice and our criminal justice system, it's it is it's about accountability, but and it's about making somebody whole who, as best as the system can can accomplish that, where somebody has suffered an injury. But it is also about deterrence. I'm, uh, I mean, the Ford Pinto case. Uh, you know, if we didn't have civil litigation to take on Ford over its its defective tailpipes, would they have corrected? Uh, that no. defect. Of course, we know that they wouldn't because they, they weren't doing it at the time before there was this litigation. Uh, you can go on down the line. The opioid manufacturers, uh, the manufacturers of Roundup uh, that have caused so many people to be exposed to, you know, carcinogen uh, chemicals. You can, you, you can, th- uh, you can, you know, companies that engage in anti-competitive behavior. Uh, I mean, you can go right down the line of our civil justice system and, and understand the, de- the positive deterrent effect that civil litigation uh, allows and creates, except for in these huge areas of exception. Um, and, and, and I want to give some examples of the kinds of cases that have been foreclosed in court. But to, to understand that, I think I want, we have to go back to something you said earlier uh, about the Ferries case itself, the Supreme Court's decision in the, in in Ferries in 1950, which you described as one of the most egregious cases of judicial activism, meaning law created by judges rather than by Congress, is that because of the the sort of manufacturing of the language incident to service, where where they said as long as the conduct is incident to service even if it doesn't involve battlefield command and control and, and hierarchy and so on, as long as it's, quote, incident to service, which I gather can be defined about as broadly as you choose to, just like many people will say something's in our national security, which can mean anything and, any, and everything, really. Uh, is, that, is, that what you're, is that what you're referring to? Yeah. And, it, you know, curiously enough, Jonathan Turley, uh, who teaches at GW, who, who suddenly catapulted onto the national stage by being on the panel of law professors and declaring that while what the president did might have been wrong, it wasn't impeachable. Jonathan Turley um, uh, has written on a number of occasions that the, the court's um, misconstruction of the FTCA uh, in the Ferris case, is one of the most egregious examples of ju- judicial activism in the history of our republic. So, if you, I mean, take that for what it's worth. This is judicial activism because Congress hadn't really decided this question. And certainly, it's up to um, agencies of government or the courts from time to time to, to fill in gaps in legislation. But this wasn't just filling in a gap. This was creating a, a, a whole new prohibition on liability. If Congress had intended in 1946 to limit the claims of service members this severely, they certainly would have said so. I mean, keep in mind the year. It's 1946. The whole country is thinking about our military establishment, the end of the war, how uh, people in the armed forces have served. There's, in the legislative history, endless discussion about this. And the fact that it's not in the FTCA uh, speaks volumes. For the Supreme Court, four years later, to say, gee, this is what the FTCA actually means when it comes to members of the armed forces, is the definition of judicial activism. Well, it's, and, it, 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 and as you point it, out... I mean, that's what it is. And as you point out, here we are at that point in our history, welcoming home the liberators of the free world, you know, who... who right. Who not only defeated Hitler, but came, in, you know, went off to war, sacrificed their lives 
in defense of all the things that make America worth fighting for, make this country and its values worth defending, and then arrive home to be told, yeah, we're taking away your rights. <laughs> that's pretty horrible. Yeah, I mean, that's basically, that's basically what happened is that Congress wasn't willing to say that. Yeah. And four years later, the Supreme Court was. So, and so, again, well, I, I, you know, I go back because I, I think it's to, to, to be um, fair and also to understand why this is difficult. Um, it's, it's not an easy question. And the Supreme Court, I think, decided to answer it. But just the answer that they gave is incorrect and has led to unbelievable suffering. Um, the, the incidents of, of sexual assault and rape in the, in the military are, uh, it's an epidemic. I mean, it doesn't take much looking at statistics to realize that. Well, why is that? It's because there's no consequence to the federal government for, for engaging in that form of misconduct. And when it comes to medical malpractice, some of the cases uh, that have uh, been litigated and lost involve malpractice. That is just shocking. Uh, so in overstepping their bounds in the interest of pre preserving the military, the Supreme Court created an injustice, and now, it really is time to correct it. Now, Andy, you mentioned that, uh, and I think you were specifically referring to sexual assault on an, yeah. a member of the armed services as being something that it's hard to understand why this would be the kind of claim foreclosed to a member of the armed services when the military uh, does recognize it as something wrongful and, and not acceptable. Um, there are or there is a system of military justice. Uh, there are military courts. Um, Right. Is that an argument for why those kinds of claims should not be allowed in ordinary federal courts where all other citizens can pursue their rights when they are similarly injured? And if not, why not? Why is that not good enough? I think the data speaks volumes. Mm -hmm. um, not only is there a system uh, for uh, punishing those who have been convicted of sexual assault and rape. There is a lot of training about it, uh, and there, there is, uh, I'd say, a high level of consciousness about it coming from the highest levels of armed forces. Especially people recently. Acknowledging that, yeah, recently. Not people acknowledging this is a problem. So, so obviously what we're doing now in just going after a perpetrators hasn't worked. If it, if it was working, then the incidence of and the number of times these, these, these events take place would be a lot less. And so there, you have to take a step back and say, well, well you know, why, isn't, why aren't things better if, if we're prosecuting people who engage in this misconduct? And the answer is because the government itself has no accountability, none. And the fact that a victim may or may not be caught, may or may not be, be convicted, has nothing to do with whether the federal government pays a price uh, when it hosts a system uh, where people interact, where these harms occur, and when they occur, the federal government bears no consequence. So this hasn't been about whether a perpetrator ought to be punished. This is about whether the government ought to bear responsibility and be accountable when people who are working within it and are engaged in, in uh, our national defense are either victimized or victimizers, uh, and, and the government has no accountability, so there's no deterrence. And that's the problem. Um, as soon as you have some accountability, as I said, I, I, I think things improve considerably. You know, unless, unless everything that's ever been written about psychology uh, and, and the, the field of criminal justice is wrong, unless B.F. Skinner ended up being nuts, people like avoiding punishment. Yeah. People don't want to be punished. People don't want to have sanctions. The government doesn't want to have sanctions. It's no different than any other individual uh, or, or, or business or entity. Yeah. Uh, so create liability and watch the change. Right.
create accountability and watch the change. All right, and just uh, just in case people are listening and are hearing a banging noise in the background in the studio here, it is very cold in Philadelphia today, and I, and and uh, the the radiators are kicking on for some reason, <laughs> and uh, they're very loud. So I apologize for for that uh, background noise. Um, well, and, and the other point about the military courts, Andy, is because you've talked about accountability, but the, the other issue is you're relying on the government in effect to prosecute itself. And I think you can almost say as a matter of common sense that that, that can't be as effective as, you know, as, as the kind of justice you'd get in a more independent environment like the federal courts where, you know, all the rest of us get to bring our claims. The government, because the government is not accountable in any way, either in a court of general jurisdiction uh, or an administrative tribunal or within DOD, they they don't bear accountability, they, the federal government, for um, these harms, these activities that are obviously not part of anything sanctioned in any way by the military. Uh, It's not just a matter of of the willingness to prosecute, it's that there's, there's no structure uh, there's no foundation for for prosecution because the government, um, at least in terms of our our courts, remains immune. Um, but the the um, that the lack of that accountability uh, is deafening. It's deafening. And for for, for you know I, I know um, we can get to to the, some positive things have happened. Uh, there is a, a you know now under the new uh, NDAA, a system to deal with at least medical malpractice that we can discuss. And that's something to watch, whether that actually changes the incidence of malpractice or not. Now, am I right that the late Justice Scalia uh, expressed views very consistent with yours, frustrated with the uh, the fairies doctrine and uh, the limitation on these rights? Absolutely. I mean, that's... That, uh, Justice, Justice well, Scalia, that. Justice that's Ginsburg, fascinating. I mean, just, there are many, many people on the Supreme Court, people in Congress, who have taken a step back and, and said, what are we doing here? And Scalia, being inclined to, to speak bluntly, speaks bluntly about it in, in cases where the Supreme Court denies cert. And he said, geez, what, I mean, what are we doing? This doesn't make any sense. Um, and, you know, not for things that are basically unrelated to the essential nature of, of the conduct of our, our armed forces. So, um, you know, that should that should be enough for people to know that uh, Justice Ginsburg and Justice Scalia and many others on the court and in our federal courts have said, time's up, time's up, time, time to deal with this. This is, this is wrong. As, as I said before, if you're willing to fight and potentially die for a system of justice, the idea that you're completely excluded from it when something happens that's not part, not sanctioned by, not necessary in the military, it's just plain wrong. And so, time to step up and be accountable. So what is the conservative argument here then? What is the Scalia argument? Because that's fascinating to me that uh, a justice we think of as being conservative, and I think Clarence Thomas is also joined in this. Yeah. W- what is the conservative case for uh, undoing or at least reforming uh, the Ferry's principle? Simple justice requires notice and an opportunity to be heard and a day in court. And the the idea that that would undermine uh, discipline would only be true if one uh, allowed a claimant to go after things that are essential to discipline. And they're not. Uh, what we're talking about is not. And so I think the conservative argument is kind of a de minimis argument in terms of the consequences to um to DOD uh, and, and, and the vision of an efficient armed forces. And I think uh, Thomas and, and, and uh, Justice Thomas and Justice Scalia saw through the smokescreen that was created by DOD saying, no, no, no you know, any liability will compromise uh, our ability to have an efficient and, and orderly and disciplined armed forces. And so that's just simply not true. Well, it sounds, it's actually the opposite. So it sounds like it's that takes us back to what you were saying about the, the Supreme Court decision itself in the Ferry's case, that, there, that it was an act of judicial legislating 
by adding the language incident to service, I can see I can see a justice like Scalia saying the Supreme Court, you know, far overextended its authority by adding that, and it doesn't match up. It isn't consistent with other core principles that you could see someone like Scalia, uh, and even a justice like Ginsburg, uh, you know, getting together on um, absolutely basic it's core absolutely rights. Right. Yeah, and 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 one of the core tenets of conservatism is uh, to make sure that uh, people who go through, certainly who go through the, the, the nomination process and are appointed to serve as judges understand that their role is not to formulate public policy. It's not to be legislators. It's to determine uh, how to resolve disputes and to determine whether things are constitutional, but not to be making law. And, uh, you know, going back to your question about why would uh, Justices Scalia and Thomas uh, take this position. I think that's as good an answer as any. Mm-hmm. This is this is a core conservative tenet. Justice um, is not served when judges who are part of Article Three decide to take on the policymaking responsibilities of members of Congress in Article One. That judicial activism. I mean, it's in every plank mm-hmm. uh, a presidential uh, platform for the last fifty years. Uh, to 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 go after judicial activism, so Ferris is ju- judicial activism at its worst. So one answer may be that, as we've seen, this court, the Supreme Court, move towards uh, a, a more conservative balance in terms of the justices on the court. Um, Justice Kavanaugh, and Justice Gorsuch, you know, appointed under the current president. It, it it seems like it could be that the next big fairies case that makes it to the Supreme Court could find a more receptive audience in terms of revisiting the excesses that the original 1950 case uh, created. You know, the Supreme Court has had this issue teed up for it over and over. Uh, it, it, it This past spring, it had it in... in, in the United States v. Daniel case involving an officer in the Navy, uh, a, a woman who um, was um, um, pregnant and goes into a uh, naval facility, a hospital, to have it, have her child. Um, the the uh, delivery has some issues, but certainly nothing beyond the, the normal management skills of a well-run um, uh, delivery in a hospital, and yet uh, she bleeds to death. She bleeds to death. It's, it's a, a, an unbelievable case. Um, and she's ignored, and and things get worse and worse, and and ultimately she dies. Um, and that case went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court, and and this is just a few months ago, and the Supreme Court says, well, gee, you know, we have this Ferris doctrine, and we're not about to change it, and that's where you get this dissent from Thomas and Ginsburg joining forces, saying. You got to be kidding me! I mean, it's time to make this change. Whether uh, the court in the future would take a different position, you know, I I don't know. Um, it seems to me that that they've they created this mess, um, but maybe it's really Congress that needs to solve it. You know, I right right now we are, as I said, we are looking at the first. Um, the very first slice of light in this doctrine with the system that's been created to allow uh, administratively uh, claims for malpractice to be heard within an administrative tribunal in DOD. Um, And that just happened this month um, that that comes into into play. We'll see how that works. Um, But, but, you know, whether it's the Supreme Court or Congress uh, that finally takes the bull by the horns and and, and undoes uh, this harm. Personally, I, you know, as a law professor, it doesn't either one's fine with me. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and you outline Andy seven categories of claims, whether it ends up being Congress that fixes fairies or the Supreme Court that finally uh, takes a case and 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 is willing to go back and revisit the original decision. You outlined seven categories of claims that ought to be 
uh, accepted from the this general rule of uh, you know government immunity or sovereign immunity of limitations right. uh, in terms of claims that would be brought by arms uh, members of the armed services and their families why these particular categories because there is nothing in in our uh, military in the armed forces there's nothing uh, that permits any of these to take place. These are all clearly prohibited acts. Sexual assault, rape, uh, e extreme violence that, that falls within the definition of torture, uh, medical malpractice, exposure uh, to, to chemicals or narcotics without consent or information, um, and, I, and uh, certain types of, of uh, clear and invidious discrimination. Uh, and then I added to, to, to that um, multiple acts of, of driving under the influence, and I, I did that because it's it's absolutely and explicitly prohibited. So I picked I picked seven things that I know uh, are are prohibited um, that can be the basis of sanction, that can be the basis of incarceration, that are taking place within our military now, that our military is trying to address. And these, so, are, these are not, just so people understand, these are not categories that affect just a couple of people every year. I mean, you've, you know, we've, you've talked about the high incidence of sexual assault on members of the armed services. Um, the fact that you include uh, as one of these categories of claims exposure to toxins uh, reminds me, and I know this has been a subject of a lot of litigation in the last decade, the, uh, what happened at Camp Lejeune um, right. with the contamination of the groundwater there um, and the inability of those who, who lived there, including spouses of uh, members of the armed services who were exposed. Some of those people developed cancer. Uh, and other illnesses, uh, but we're unable to bring claims for those injuries the way someone not affiliated with the armed services would be free to do. Uh, that's right. And for me, it begins, of course, with dioxins, uh, mm. with Agent Orange. Yeah, right. Um, and and but you can take it through to Camp Lejeune, um, and and from my perspective, you know the different types of of misconduct. They're they're there are harms that occur that shouldn't occur when you look back on it and say, gee, if we would have known this and this and done that, we could have avoided this. That's not what the, that, that's not what these cases are about. Certainly not what it's about in Lejeune. It's, it's when you do know there's a problem and you don't do anything about right. it, and, and consequently people get sick and die. Um, again, just from my perspective, looking at deterrence, I'm, more, I'm interested in that. I'm interested in deterring that misconduct. You know, if, if somebody clever wants to come up with innocent negligence and make that a category where you can't bring a lawsuit, which is what discretionary function is, fine with me. We're talking about egregious misconduct in, in most of these things where people know, do nothing, subject members and their families and their children to, to terrible risk, and that risk manifests, and those folks can't do anything about it. I mean, they, you know, they can get uh, their health care covered within the military, but that that hardly creates an incentive to do anything. Obviously, it doesn't create an incentive to do anything more because this, it, it keeps happening. Right. Well, it's a, it's, it, it's a fascinating, uh, challenging, and, and really painful um, situation for so many people. It's, it's complex, and you can see the reasons for that, the, the good reasons uh, the understandable reasons, but but uh, I, I have to agree. There's uh, something has to be done. There are too many people who are affected by this, and if you care about you know basic core fundamental rights and freedoms, and you care about the members of the armed services, you point out in uh, in in this article that was published in the Boston College Law Review, which we will include a link to in the description for this episode, Andy. You point out that. Uh, there's hardly, uh, you know, presidential speech or a member of Congress who, who, you know, who meets with voters who doesn't take time to thank our veterans. And yet right. here, 
here we are really sticking it to them in 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 a really unfair and uh, in in ways that just go so against uh, so many c- c- core principles, the kinds that they uh, go to uh, battle to defend for all of us. It's just a uh, it's a fascinating, challenging, and uh, disturbing. Uh, problem and uh, th- the article you did in the Boston College Law Review is terrific and and uh, though it is a law review article it's it's one I know because I read it last night uh, it's one anyone could read and and, and really get a full uh, summary and discussion of of this issue that we've been talking about so I'll encourage everybody to take a look at that um, I said we would leave some time at the end and I do want to because uh, uh, you sent me a couple of audio books of novels that you've written, and yep. uh, I apologize that I haven't had a chance to listen to them. I do intend to, and uh, they've, they've gotten terrific reviews, uh, not only for the writing, but for the audio versions of those books, which I know you you, you took very seriously. Uh, tell us a little bit about your fiction writing uh, uh, and, and these two books in particular, Andy. Sure. Um, about geez, I don't know, a, a good 25 years ago, um, I, I, as a law professor, was working in the law school, doing my job, teaching, and I was member a member of what we called our space committee, dealing with a new building. And uh, it turned out that we got into a not-in-my-backyard fight with some adjacent neighbors that went on for 10 years. And when I finished that and watched and participated in, I represented the the law school for a time as our primary voice, um, I took a step back and had to ask myself, how could so many good people in these neighborhoods who otherwise were decent and smart be so scared and so outraged by something as simple as a building on our property that they wouldn't even see? And it, it's a hard question to answer. And I, it, it's, it, it's the only sabbatical I've taken in that last quarter century. And I really sat down and tried to think through, why is it that people get so upset uh, about these changes? And, and the best I could do after a year of thinking about it is come up with uh, the idea that, that change is difficult and, and frightening. And it wasn't enough for me. And so I decided, I'm going to write about this. Um, and... Uh, Try to write the, the typical law review article and uh, wasn't particularly useful. And I talked to our uh, the university lawyer at the time. She said, "Why don't you you know try fiction?" And I thought, yeah, "That's a good idea." So uh, I did, and and I wrote a manuscript for a book called Bordering on Madness. And I thought probably the best thing that's ever been written. You know, after all, I'm a tenured law professor and I write all the time. Just going to be a question of whether I want it to be a, a you know a, a blockbuster movie or spend a year on the bestseller list, and and it turned out, at least in the initial draft, that it was so bad uh, <laughs> that I couldn't even get an agent. And it's harder I, than it looks. <laughs> it's a lot harder than it looks, and I realized yeah. that um, when you are uh, trying to tell a story and you're trying to communicate with an audience beyond the legal community, that the way we write as lawyers is not the right way. Yeah. And I had to completely rethink hmm. narrative. I had to rethink how I teach, um, and obviously how uh, one goes about telling a decent tale. Yeah. I took classes at a place called the Writers' Center in Bethesda, um, and when I circulated my manuscript to, to my writer's group and they all wrote all over it, this is terrible. You know, finally Dawn broke over Marblehead and I thought, I really, really need to relearn how to do this. Um, and so for the last uh, 20 years or so, I've worked on, on writing fiction. I've written novels, I've written poems, and I do it because, in all honesty, nothing I have ever done has helped my teaching more hmm. than writing fiction. Wow. Nothing I've ever done has helped my legal writing more than writing fiction. And, and I, I very much appreciate what you said about the um, Boston College Law Review piece. Um, 
But that is how I'm trying to write now. And, you know, these are stories to be told. Legal writing has its own discipline. Um, you know, John Grisham uh, once said when he was talking about his book, The Innocent Man, which is one of the only things that he's ever written that's fictional, and he was asked if he liked it, and he said, oh, it's awful. You can't lie. You have to document everything. And legal writing kind of has that quality. It has to be true. Fiction doesn't. Um, but just writing fiction isn't so easy, and learning how to show a decent story as opposed to tell it, uh, learning how to trust your readers to understand it, just the same as I need to trust my students to work with the information I'm putting out there and and recognize that it's a collaborative process. Writing, I'm collaborating with my readers. Uh, when I write something now, including those two audio books, I believe I have a simple contract, and this is it. If if you're going to take the time and invest in my work, I'm going to make it worth your while. I'm going to I'm going to write so that you feel like your time was well spent. Just the same as if you're going to come to my class and listen to me for two hours and have me ask you difficult questions in class, you're going to leave class thinking that was worth it. And and. Honestly, that's how I got in. Otherwise, how could you justify as a full-time law professor taking the time to, to write fiction? Uh, and there were a few other things involved. I, I wanted to write about good lawyers. And, and, and you know, all, all uh, um, uh, arrogant society, like you, good lawyers like you, people who are willing to take on tough cases and, and take on risk and do so with dignity and with purpose, uh, and I worry that so much of popular culture about lawyers involves literature that boils down to yet another lawyer joke, when in fact, uh, I believe that, that we are the keepers of our legal system. We are, we are the, the, the voice of our legal heritage, that it's not Congress and it's not the president and it's not the courts, it's us. Uh, and we are the ones who have to make sure our system of justice works, that our hearings are fair. And, and we do that. Uh, and I think in the last few years, people have come to understand how important that is. I wanted to write about it. Yeah. I wanted to write books where there were decent lawyers. Maybe they were, uh, in one book, a reluctant lawyer who finally comes back to the profession wondering, why am I doing this? Um, who, who achieve, and achieve not easily, and, and, and not necessarily uh, with, with a level of greatness, but, but do what the legal system requires. So I committed myself to it, and... Uh, the end result was I, I did rewrite over and over again, bordering on madness until it became publishable. And then I wrote these two other books, Rediscovering Lone Pine and Sunrise at the American Market. Both took about five years. Um, to me, uh, they that, this is my best writing. Mm. And I decided when they were done that the medium that, that was easiest for people is an audio book. And so... I just went went to my publishers and got copyright permission and decided I've been produced as audiobooks. But that's the writing story for me. It's great. It's and it's inspiring. And uh, I, you know, a couple just a couple of reactions. I mean, I I remember when I decided to go to law school after a writing career, a journalism career, and writing career, and overwhelmingly the reaction I got from people is, "Why do we need more lawyers?" And my answer was always the same. I said, I said because we don't have enough good ones, um, you know. And and I've I've seen in my own practice, in my own professional life, how much my experience as a writer helped me has helped me. The not not just the writing itself, but what goes into the writing, the 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 developing of the story, the developing of character, thinking about who people are and how you present them. Um, from journalism, the, the you know interviewing witnesses, uh, reviewing documents in a way that that looks for those things that help you tell the story that you want to tell, and uh, people people here who who've worked f- with me for a long time know that I'm uh, I, I'm very r- ruthless with my editing and and rigid in standards because. I feel that the way you described feeling about, you know, your writing, that if I'm going to submit something to a judge, uh, it better be good. And, you know, legal writing doesn't have to be bad writing. In fact, it should be good legal writing. It should be good writing, period, and not just good legal writing. So I've, I've, I've tried to follow that, 
you know, throughout my years as, as a trial lawyer. Uh, and it's inspiring to hear because I think people don't give a, enough credit uh, to the importance of good writing. And, uh, uh, and you've, you've seen that. We will, um, you know, as I mentioned. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. It's, I couldn't agree more. And, I, I, you know, I think, as, as Francine Cruz once said, uh, when you write, put put every word on trial for its life. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love that quote. I love that too. Um, you, you know, I and and I think I think clients are entitled, and justice requires the right and best presentation of information, and that's not easy to do. Yeah, uh, you, you know, it's easy to get lost in language and 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 kind of matter on, but but good lawyers, I think, understand that, and they only can do it if they're also good writers. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, on the too many lawyers, uh, you know, we are the most complex legal society ever and, and, and one that is difficult to navigate. And just thinking about, uh, going back to this discussion of people in the armed forces, uh, JAG programs are large because even there, in a limited universe under the uniform code, you need lawyers to guide you through. Yeah. They are the ones who produce a sense of justice in the military. So, you know, as one who educates new lawyers, um, I don't have any trouble answering that question. We need good lawyers, and we need people to, 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 to guide all of us through our legal system so that our legal heritage continues. I, I love that so much, Andy. And, it, and it's why I do this podcast, too. I take it very seriously because I think, uh, you know, as, I, as the tagline for the program, I always say the law matters. And that's and uh, that means lawyers matter. And uh to show and talk about and work through really complex issues like the fairies doctrine, like we did today, yeah. um, that are so important and people ought to understand and have access to a way to understand better those ways in which the law affects our lives um, for good and for not good. And if it's not for yeah. good, what can we do about it? Make it better. Uh, so thank you so much. Wow. I really enjoyed sure. this so much. Uh, as I said, we will. We always uh, uh, create a description for the episode. Uh, we will certainly include a link to the uh, Boston College Law Review piece on the Ferry's Doctrine. And if it's okay with you, we'll include a link to your two most recent uh, novels, Rediscovering Lone Pine and Sunrise at the American Market, so people can get those too. I, I would highly recommend they do so. And I'm looking forward to uh, listening to them myself. Andy Popper, a distinguished professor of law and government at American University in Washington, D.C., also a Vietnam veteran, an expert on um, government immunity when it comes to members of our armed services, and an author. Thank you so much, Andy, for being on Good Law, Bad Law today. Well, thank you for inviting me.